I've been on a quest for almost 20 years. What the heck is the deal with Final Fantasy VI? I grew up with Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy IX. I played X when it came out. I didn't really care for MMOs, so I didn't play XI. I didn't play XIV. XII I didn't really care for. Thirteen was okay. Fifteen was all right. And 16 was really great. I really enjoyed 16. But after I finished 16, I really was craving that classic turn-based action that just wasn't available to 16 because it was just a vastly different game. So I went out and bought the Final Fantasy Pixel Remastered Collection for my Steam Deck. I was excited to take a trip back and explore some of these titles that I really haven't played before. And not only that, I really wanted to have a second chance at Final Fantasy VI. I've played it before on the Game Boy Advance, PS Vita, PSP, Super Nintendo Mini, and of course, the actual Super Nintendo cartridge. And it was only until I played everything that came before do I really truly understand what makes this game truly special. So in today's video, we're going to take a look at what makes Final Fantasy VI tick and why some people consider it to be the definitive Final Fantasy experience. Final Fantasy VI tells the story of a world torn by conflict and under the control of the Gestalian Empire. The central conflict revolves around the Empire's pursuit of magical power and their use of it for conquest. The game begins with Tara Brainford being controlled by the Empire. She is sent on a mission to Narsh to retrieve something called an Esper. Along the way, she meets a resistance group known as the Returners who oppose the Empire's tyranny. As the story unfolds, players are introduced to a large ensemble cast of characters each with their own backstories and motivations. Some of the more notable characters include Locke, a treasure hunter, Celis, a former Imperial general, Edgar and Sabin, twin brothers and rulers of Figaro, Cyan, a samurai mourning the loss of his kingdom, and fan favorite, Shadow, who'd slit his mama's throat for a nickel. You'd only know that if you played the original translation. The narrative was less straightforward than in previous games, featuring multiple character perspectives and complex plot twists with Final Fantasy tackling darker and more mature themes, such as consequences of war, loss, and identity. Also delving into the machinations of the Empire's mad jester, Kefka, who becomes the central antagonist as his lust for power spirals into madness. The second half of the game takes place in a post-apocalyptic world known as the World of Ruin. Players must reunite with their scattered party members, confront their personal demons, and ultimately culminates in an epic battle against Kefka where the characters must harness their strength and determination to stop his destructive ambitions and restore balance to the world. If we consider the fact that I had only recently played 1 through 5 prior to playing 6 in the Pixel Collection, seeing the story grow from four simple warriors of light saving the crystals and defeating chaos, to this huge tale involving more adult themes like war and death in a broken world, and it's really easy to see how Final Fantasy VI was the most mature game yet in the series. One issue that I had with Final Fantasy VI in prior playthroughs was that it doesn't really seem to be a main character. Of course, Terra is implied as the main character with her character arc seemingly being the most important, but at the same time, playing 1 through 5, now I understand the need for all these perspective shifts and mini character arcs amongst the story. It's actually pretty interesting. These characters are not one-dimensional, and they do evolve and grow throughout the game. Despite its large cast and multifaceted narrative, Final Fantasy VI manages to successfully tie together all its plot threads and character arcs into a cohesive and satisfying conclusion, one thing that I never really truly understood until now. All the characters can come together despite their differences and make the world a better place, even if it's a broken one. Character development was something that really started to happen in Final Fantasy IV. We see Cecil as the Dark Knight, commander of the Red Wings, committing atrocities for the king before looking inside himself and realizing he's doing the wrong thing, only then to be cast away and eventually atone for his sins by turning into a paladin and eventually overthrowing all the evils of the world. That's a short and sweet way to put it, but Final Fantasy IV is a fantastic game that I definitely recommend you play. With every game in the series, you could really tell that they were picking out the things that worked and didn't work in regard to storytelling. Final Fantasy VI also touches on deeper, more philosophical topics, including the nature of power, the consequences of unchecked ambitions, and the importance of hope and resilience in the face of despair. These elements add depth and a more intellectual angle to the story, and again, not really seen in the Final Fantasy games that came before. These elements are all aided not only by the world that's built within the game, but some of the more iconic scenes in Final Fantasy history, such as the opera scene, 
the destruction of the floating continent, the World of Ruin sequence, and most notably, the intro sequence where the three Magitech armors are heading towards Narsh to start the story. Simply amazing. Legendary Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu yet again takes the reins for Final Fantasy VI. Now I will say, even if you haven't played Final Fantasy VI or you're not even a massive fan of it, chances are you've heard some of the more iconic themes from this game. Uematsu's work tends to live beyond the confines of the cartridge, so to speak, and having a much more far greater reach, even if you're not a fan of video games, and his music is often celebrated by professional musicians, composers, uh, orchestras, I mean, you name some of the more iconic themes, not only just from Six, but the entire series, you might be familiar with some of his work. I've already spoken in depth about the story's complexity and the ability to emotionally invest in it, but the music really is the driving force behind the entire game, featuring a diverse and extensive soundtrack with a wide range of musical styles from epic orchestral pieces to somber and more haunting melodies, and even playful and whimsical tunes. The diversity of music suits the various moments and emotions encountered throughout the game. Now, as hardware changed from the NES to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or SNES, or NES, whatever you want to call it, the ability to add what was originally five channels worth of audio on the NES to now eight on the Super Nintendo you can imagine that as a composer, you'd feel a little bit more freedom to express and not necessarily feel limited in what you can do. You may be thinking another three tracks of audio, well, what's the difference? In some cases, that can be quite substantial considering the Super Nintendo's sound hardware allowed for composers to use more sample-based sounds rather than a few variations of one singular noise like the NES, which is why music on the Super Nintendo is so varied across the console's library. The thing that's probably most interesting to me about this entire video is that the soundtrack and sound effects for the game are on this cartridge in 64 kilobyte file size. Now, considering how huge of an impact this music has, not only in the game, but outside of it, all confined to 64 KB, I don't know, that's pretty cool. Louis Mainzu's music in Final Fantasy VI plays a pivotal role in creating emotional depth within the game. Whether it's capturing the melancholy vibe of a post-apocalyptic world or the tension of a climactic battle, the music complements the storytelling perfectly. Tracks like Terra's theme, Dancing Mad, Celeste's theme, and the decisive battle to name a few are the reason why the soundtrack as a whole plays an integral role in enhancing the overall gaming experience. Uematsu's composition for the game are considered some of the finest in the history of video game music and continue to be cherished by fans of the series worldwide. The battle system in Final Fantasy VI I think is best appreciated when you play everything that's come before it. 1, 3, 4, and 5 respectively. And of course Final Fantasy II is just something else aside because they, they did something else for that. But instead of a job system, it's more of a character based system. So for example, instead of a thief, which you can change to whatever character you want in Final Fantasy V, Locke is more of the thief role, Edgar is more of like the knight role, Savin's more of the monk role. Terra and Celes are more of the uh, white mage, black mage. You get the idea. Magic is also handled differently in this game. There are only two characters that have the ability to use magic from the get-go, which are Terra and Celes. However, characters can gain magic spells and abilities by equipping espers and earning ability points, or AP, in battle. As characters accumulate AP, they gradually learn the spells and abilities assigned to their equipped esper. Once a spell is learned, the character retains it permanently, even if they switch to a different esper. Espers are acquired throughout the story, along your travels as Magicite, a rare and precious stone coveted by the Gestile Empire. Throughout the game, you find out that there is more to the Espers than just being tools for battle. They're central to the game's plot, as they hold the key to the Empire's pursuit of magical power, after having lived alongside humans and subsequently being exploited for benefits for war, Espers seal themselves away in hopes of never being discovered again. Now I mentioned Terra and Cell as being able to use magic from the get-go, and these are major story points, and I'm about to spoil a major twist in the story here, so you've been warned. However, the game is almost 30 years old, so I guess fast forward if you don't want to hear it. But Terra is half human, half Esper, being a product of forbidden love, of course. Celes was a product of the Empire's magic infusion process that essentially gives the subject the power of magic. Final Fantasy VI's magic system is a versatile and integral aspect of the gameplay, offering many options for customizing your character, strategic depth, and the ability to harness the power of espers as mentioned before. 
It encourages the player to explore different character builds and experiment with various spells and abilities to adapt to the challenges presented throughout the game. However, the best way to do it is once you get that Ragnarok Magisite, equip it to everybody and learn Ultima. Game over. Dude, that was really sassy. Game over. Final Fantasy VI also introduced the active time battle, ATB system, which adds a sense of urgency and strategy to battles. Instead of waiting for each character to take their turn in a fixed order, characters have individual ATB gauges that fill up over time. Each character has a unique ATB gauge, the rate of which fills depending on the character's speed stat. Enemies also have their own ATB gauges and take actions when their gauges are full, meaning that battles are not strictly turn-based and the players must consider the timing of their actions to respond to enemy attacks and threats. This encourages tactical decision-making in which players must prioritize actions based on the situation. If you want to be sneaky and work around it, you can also pause the game at any time to select actions for the characters. The pause feature allows players to strategize and make decisions without feeling rushed. Certain scripted events such as character transformations or special enemy attacks may alter the flow of the ATB system, albeit temporarily, adding surprise elements to the battle. I'm looking at you, Ultros. Final Fantasy VI offered players a degree of freedom and choice in how they approached the game with a more non-linear approach through side quests, hidden items, and optional characters. The narrative structure sometimes diverges from the typical linear progression found in entries prior. If you don't realize the non-linearity of it in the early half of the game, it's really driven through in the World of Ruin portion of the game where you're tasked with getting the party back together after being split up when Kefka destroys the world. It's not stated that you have to find everyone, although I highly recommend you do, considering some of the endgame bosses require teams of at least level 50 to beat them somewhat easily. Final Fantasy VI offers hidden characters that I suppose back then you'd really have to go out of your way to stumble on. Gogo -Go is found within the Zone Eater and is more or less similar to the Mimic job from Final Fantasy V. I initially didn't see a point in using Gogo -Go until I realized that you can assign lots of different abilities to the battle menu for Gogo. -Go. In my most recent playthrough, Gogo -Go was a Sabin 2.0, using the Blitz command for every turn during the game. Umaru is found within the Caves of Narsh after you fight the Esper that was heavily featured at the beginning of the game. You can recruit Umaru to your party, although I didn't really care for Umaru personally, but to each their own. At any rate, there's a lot of optional stuff in Final Fantasy VI that's well worth your time and seeking out, and honestly, I think will make your endgame trip to Kefka's Tower all that much more easy. All that much more easy? Yeah, that, yeah. Is Kefka the best Final Fantasy bad guy? Often cited as one of the most memorable and complex antagonists in the series, his descent into madness and the devastation he caused set a new standard for video game villains. Kefka is known for his distinctive appearance reflecting his chaotic and unhinged personality, characterized by his gestures attire, maniacal expression, and iconic laugh. <laughs> Kefka serves as one of the three generals in the Gestalian Empire alongside General Leo, and Selas, and is responsible for carrying out the Empire's orders, including the pursuit of Espers and their magical power. However, he quickly becomes the central antagonist as his lust for power and madness grows ungoverned. Throughout the game, players witness Kefka's gradual descent into madness, starting with the poisoning of Doma Castle, leading midway to his manipulation of the Warring Triad to reshape the world into a desolate wasteland known as the World of Ruin and the game ending with an incredible climax involving a dramatic showdown between the players and Kefka in his godlike state, being one of the most memorable moments of the game. Kefka is a great example of a bad guy who actually managed to do everything he wanted to do, destroying the world and becoming god. And by the time you finally fight Kefka and inevitably destroy him at the end, he's done it all. He can die happy. I can't say the same for really any other Final Fantasy bad guy that I know of. Final Fantasy VI does a really great job at demonstrating Kefka's power by making the party fail at stopping him on the floating continent, thusly splitting the game into two parts, the World of Balance, which is the first half of the game, followed by the World of Ruin. There's a real sense of despair and desolation when the story picks up with Sellas stranded on the deserted island with an ailing Cid, the scientist partly responsible for the magic research that's caused so much destruction. These moments partnered with Salas' immense grief and attempting to end her own life as a result makes a powerful statement about second chances and not succumbing to a moment of weakness caused by depression or sadness, something not yet explored in Final Fantasy to this point. Now there's a lot to unpack with Final Fantasy VI more than what I've said in this 
kind of brief video and i really highly encourage you to check out final fantasy 6 if you haven't played it yet and if you have played it chances are the wheels will be spinning in your brain thinking of some of the more iconic and memorable moments and characters throughout your journey of course i haven't mentioned everybody there's a lot of great characters throughout the game of course i only mentioned a handful but that just shows the depth that this game actually has to offer and something that i didn't appreciate until playing all the games that came before. Final Fantasy VI is really quite the shift from the original four warriors of light trying to protect the crystals. The story was more focused on the intricacies of the characters and the world that they lived in, as opposed to a more broad save the world story. Not to say that there wasn't a huge focus on the narrative, like in Final Fantasy IV or V, for example. Final Fantasy VI is so story rich with more adult themes like identity, freedom, and redemption. I can now confidently say that I finally get Final Fantasy VI after having played all the games that come before it. And now I suppose I have a greater appreciation for Final Fantasy VII because I'm a bigger Final Fantasy VII fan than I am VI. VI really sets the stage for Final Fantasy VII to truly reign supreme as the GOAT of the Final Fantasies. So anyway, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed this little bit of a uh, in-depth or introspective or retrospective on Final Fantasy VI. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a like, a subscribe if you haven't already, and leave a comment down below. Let me know if there's any iconic moments from this game that you really truly enjoyed, or if you just simply dislike this game altogether. So thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again on the next video. Take care.